Hello everyone, I hope you've been enjoying all the AdventureX interviews and panels so far. For this one we're going to be discussing a quick overview of academic research around games, where to find this and some ideas for incorporating it into your practice. For context, my name is Alain Labelle, I graduated from a Masters earlier this year at KCL and I've been assisting with games research in the department since then. I've had my own experiences of gathering academic sources, particularly for a thesis on indie game production, uh, but there I had the advantage of university level access to databases. So we'll take a look at how to find research outside of this context. For this I'm coming to you in an individual, non-representative capacity, and we'll touch on some of the known knowledge sources, like journals, how to find these in open access, and some additional context for the industry in the UK. So you can perhaps go away afterwards and look at some areas that might prove interesting or relevant to you. I should note that I'll be looking at this from the perspective of looking for English language research, and speaking from a UK-focused perspective in terms of trade bodies, policy and academia, but as I'm sure you'll find, there's an absolute ton of excellent research outside of this. Obviously, there's also a lot of industry research that produces statistics and data points in industry reports and the like, conducted by companies like Newzoo and market researchers like Quantic Foundry, although that actually came from a more academic background. But here we're focusing on a more university-centred academic research that operates through a different kind of ecosystem. So there's plenty of research on games, and it touches on different facets of its production and consumption, from music to art to writing to procedural generation. As you'll see later in the talk, there are different locations and resource groups you can look at to find this, but this research can be integrated on your own terms. You might just read a few papers to give you an outline concept for how to approach a new idea in the ideation phase, or bring it in later to help solve an issue, or just give a fresh perspective if you feel like you've hit a plateau or a dead end with your design. Games research can also give you another way to engage with games that you love and reflect on the experience from a more player-focused perspective. You might want to check out articles like this one on self-reflexivity and humour in adventure games. This discusses meta-elements, parody and nostalgia in the genre. There's also plenty of research which isn't directly on games, but which can have valuable potential applications to it, whether that's in organisational studies to look at how to run teams in studios sustainably, or in research that adds depth or complexity to topics that are integrated into your games. That might range across history or art, psychology, any other discipline that forms part of your game as a creative work, your game's themes or form or style. The research may capture some of your own experiences of working in an industry and help you in building a linguistic framework and points of reference when coming together with your own communities of practice to discuss your experiences together. Developers obviously engage in plenty of research already, both in exploring what to put in their games and how to execute them, particularly since games are multimedia works. One of the best parts of being a community of practice is sharing resources and knowledge, so this might just form another part of your creative processes, adding another perspective or a layer to your approach or nuance and texture to a work. Now, a lot of research is paywalled, and affiliation with a university typically gives you access to a much wider range of papers and resources through their database licenses than you can just get yourself, but that doesn't mean you can't find a considerable amount of research open access, nor does it mean that this situation will be the same forever. So regarding that open access, there are broadly two types, green and gold open access. With green open access, which can be read immediately without payment or any kind of subscription, the author will self-archive their paper on a non-commercial site or repository. The article will appear in, say, a paid journal, uh, but you can access it freely from the archive site. Often the version will differ slightly, such as being the version of the article accepted by a journal but not the finalised published version, just something to bear in mind, and there's also sometimes an embargo period after general publication before it appears on the archive. For gold open access, the published version is immediately available in an open access journal, so you access the research directly through that. There can be article processing charges associated with this to fund these journals, and they're paid by the authors or their institutions or funders, and there can be different rights of retention, etc. There's also what's sometimes referred to as diamond or platinum open access journals, these subsidise the cost of publication and don't have charges to publish with them. Some subscription journals are hybrids, whereby if charges are paid for individual articles, then they become open access. Uh, this means they're paid for both journal subscriptions and these release fees, uh, which is a point of some contention. These charges can be quite steep, in some cases around, say, £3,000, but some research funders do cover these charges. Also, certain funders actually require an open access publication, sometimes with a choice of a green or gold route, as part of the terms of their funding. So with that context established, let's move on to talking about actually searching for research. So regarding search functions, without a university library catalogue, you might want to start off with some simple but effective functions like Google Scholar. This is a different, more specialised function than just Google, but it looks and operates very similarly. 
If you see a title and you read an extract that seems interesting, uh, these can sometimes be available via a direct link on Google Scholar. If there's not a direct link like the one you can see highlighted down the right hand side, you might want to try the other versions button below the individual result. This can help identify other locations where you might be able to access the text. If you see something of particular interest, you can also search for it via ResearchGate. You can add that term to your standard Google search query for it. Here we can see an example from our very own AdventureX academic, Dr. Tom Cole. ResearchGate functions as a kind of researcher networking platform uh, where authors upload their papers, and they actually will sometimes upload further papers upon requests that aren't there otherwise. As you can see from this very, very simple Google Scholar search, entering a few keywords can generate a lot of results. Obviously, being more specific is usually the way to go. Uh, Google Scholar does have an advanced search function, and it supports Boolean operators, alongside some other symbols and word combinations, say to filter for words in title or in text. You can also see that there's a related articles button under the results. Uh, this relatedness seems to be a combination of factors like authors, title and abstract analysis, and looking at citations in the work, uh, but the weighting of those factors isn't completely clear. It can be worth it to look at what other resources it might uncover. You can also see the citation count highlighted under each result. Uh, you'll see this on a lot of platforms for academic writing, and the amount of citations can be a very helpful flag for the significance of a paper. There are other metrics that you will see above papers in a similar vein, like impact factor and five-year impact factor. It is worth noting, however, that certain types of research, like more niche, specialised topics, might not enjoy the same level of reach and therefore citation attention, or indeed if they're read by people practising in a field, but not engaging with them or citing them. But this doesn't imply any inherent inferiority or lack of quality in the research. Nonetheless, it can be very helpful in understanding discussions on a topic to know what work has been highly cited and considered of high importance, and that can help you when you read other work later because you understand the reference points for the topic. On the subject of citations, these can also be a helpful source of chaining to find other research that touches on the same topic. This approach of chaining or reading can be used when checking the reference list or the bibliography at the end of a paper, which then can allow you to follow up on ideas and concepts that the main paper mentioned. So there are plenty of other sites that are regularly used to source papers, but these can require a university account, and some are more useful if you've already conducted broader searches, say through Google Scholar, and are now looking within narrower parameters. There are many, many different, often more specialised sites from various publishers, institutions, companies that index or aggregate titles, uh, and books and articles and other academic papers, and in some cases they also provide direct access to papers across various connected databases. However, many are paid and subscription services, like Scopus and Web of Science, for example, uh, and the paid services sometimes cannot even be accessed by individuals. There are some sites like Semantic Scholar, Project Muse or Base that are free to search, but that doesn't mean that all the results generated are free or open access. You may find that some have different methods for searching for results from keywords, like a high priority on titles as opposed to in-text, etc. Uh, some, like JSTOR, can have direct access. A JSTOR also contains books and other primary sources, as does ProQuest, with resources like videos and conference proceedings, uh, but again, most access is via subscription or payment, although JSTOR does have an open and free content search function. There's also Core, connecting repositories, based here in the UK, uh, which collects and indexes a large collection of open access papers. Additionally, the Internet Archive Scholar is a free search engine for a broad archive of various different open access research sources. You can also use a service called Access to Research in any participating UK library, and that's provided through agreement with their publishers via designated library terminals. So clearly there are many, many different databases and starting points, many of which can be specific to the discipline or the language you want to explore research in. Uh, this Wikipedia link below lists some of these larger databases and search engines, and it also notes which are free. There are also specific organisations with digital libraries, like the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers, who have a lot of specialised journals and conferences that can be of interest to games. Though again, not all papers or journals are freely available, this link goes to their Open Resources main page. There's also the site for the Association for Computing Machinery's Digital Library, and that's moving towards full open access. This can be very helpful for uncovering research on any kind of games topics, particularly things to do with like programming, uh, perhaps human-computer interaction. Uh, this one currently contains a mixture of paid and open journals, books and conference proceedings. There's also the Directory of Open Access Journals, which collates open access journals and articles across disciplines and languages. So that can just be worth a few keywords in it to look into different areas. 
There are sites like Archive, which is a pre-publication site used for the aforementioned self-archiving process, which can mean that there's some variations from the final version of the article in a journal. This has a particular focus on areas like physics, mathematics, and computer science, uh, so it should be particularly useful if you're looking into topics in these areas. If you are looking at the work of a particular academic, sometimes there will be direct links to papers via their university page. So if you do find something of interest, it can help to look up not just the text, but the author as well. Some academics also have their own websites or blogs. Um, there's a well-known video game theorist, Jesper Yule, and he has links to the indie developer interviews that form part of his book, Handmade Pixels, which is about authenticity and independent game making, linked from his blog. So moving on to talking about these resources more directly, as for peer reviewed journals, there are of course many, some more specialized than others, spanning technical topics, business and areas like player interaction and art. Uh, for example, here's an article looking at crunch culture. Uh, high quality journals will have their quality criteria checklist to see if research meets not just their area of interest, but also their standards. If you want to see some broad examples of editor approaches to research checking, uh, you can have a look at this page of basic arts and humanities research article review checklists from the editor resources in Taylor Francis. It's also worth bearing in mind that many of the parameters and terms we use to assess quality are always under ongoing discussion and improvement as to their appropriateness, particularly in a qualitative context. Journals will have different publishing frequencies and article requirements, and there are also special issues, which will usually hone in on one particular subject. Journals can contain a range of different article types, from the results of experiments to theoretical analysis, case studies, analysing data from interviews, analysis of literature in a field, and book reviews. And all of these can be approached from different perspectives and lenses. It is also worth keeping an eye on the date of the research. While it isn't always the case, approaches to or solutions for a topic can change significantly over time. In the case of technical matters, it can even become obsolete. So it's just something to keep in mind. So here we have a list of some well-known games focused journals. This is obviously not an exhaustive or definitive list, uh, but you'll often see references from journals like Games and Culture in other research papers, specifically those on the right are open access. And there's also the journals that are hybrid where accessibility varies from article to article and closed journals, but the papers might be available elsewhere. If you are interested in a particular journal, many have their own search functions on their web pages. Also, as you can see, certain journals focus on a particular area or discipline within games, like audio. And there's also a lot of games writing journals that have a slightly broader focus. They might cover topics around new technology in society, media journals, or those discussing online communities. So besides journal articles, there are obviously many other mediums, like full-length books, talks and conference proceedings. There are full text of books available on sites like the Directory of Open Access Books, and which works as a discovery service for books across various platforms. Academic book publishing more broadly can be subject to publishing charges and has different models of funder or institutional support. Books will sometimes flip to open access, for example, after a certain sales amount is reached. These books can obviously vary greatly in their subject matter, from charting the history of video game production to analysing games as text, or indeed taking a more case study approach to looking in depth at a particular genre or even a company. There are books like Game Production Studies, edited by game scholars Sotomar and Schwelk, that are freely available to download. And books like this are not by a single author, but are instead edited collections of different specialised essays or chapters on a topic. So they can be a good way of hearing from a variety of voices on a particular area in a more streamlined format. In fact, Amsterdam University Press, which published this book, also has a lot of open access academic books on games, including in their Games and Play series. Uh, there are also sites like Perlego, where for a more reasonable fixed subscription fee, you gain access to their whole catalogue of academic research and textbooks. And of course, we shouldn't neglect shouting out a free public third space. It doesn't hurt to check out your library to see what they offer either physically or digitally. I'm sure that most listeners are familiar with the many, many different industry talks from games conferences, and GDC does also have a research track, which is linked here. Um, but there are also academic conferences, like DIGRA's very prestigious one, that are collaborations between academia and industry. They publish the written proceedings from their conference and have a collection of open access research papers. There are many other conferences attached to various organisations and institutions around the globe. Though there can be some restrictions on who can attend, some publish their conference proceedings or talk recordings online. Conferences like DIGRA can have a different centralising theme or topic each year, as the papers and talks will draw out and explore. Usually these conferences feature talks, panels, workshops, poster sessions and academic networking opportunities. 
Uh, for clarity, poster sessions are where research information is presented on a poster in an area of the uh, conference space and attendees can talk with the researchers next to their respective work. There are, as mentioned previously, many other conferences like Kai Play with their Games Play and HCI Human Computer Interaction Focus or Foundation of Digital Games, both of which are connected to the ACM. You can obviously go away and see if there are any conferences that are of particular interest or relevance for you. Alongside our universities that now have specialist undergraduate and postgraduate degrees in games fields, uh, in the UK we do also have the world's largest PhD research programme focused on games research in the form of the IGGI, which is based at the University of York, Queen Mary, Goldsmiths and Essex, and they also have their own conference. If you are considering further education in an area of games research, you might want to have a look at their areas of focus. Now, we all know that the umbrella of games encompasses incredibly broad forms of creative work with diverse methods of production and consumption. Uh, but finally, just a brief word on the policy and trade body context that games operate in here, just to add context to the research and game making in the UK. So from a government perspective, games falls under the Department for Culture, Media and Sport. There are often aims for maximizing the economic benefit of the games industries, as well as examining working standards and the social and psychological impact of games. There was a video games research framework published last year with the aim of increasing the amount of quality research on video games in several key research areas. There are also white papers and various specialist reports on particular subjects around games that come under discussion by government. The topic of loot boxes, for example, has been under ongoing discussion. We also have trade bodies for games and interactive media in the UK in the form of Yuki and Tiga. Uh, Tiga has their own game industry awards and they're engaged in collecting data around areas surrounding policy and the working environment in games as well as games education, and they have a specialised conference and awards on that subject. Their 2024 manifesto includes items like campaigning for the creation of an independent games tax credit to increase the claimable benefit for games with production budgets below 15 million. Yuki has just announced its strategy plan Supercharge. Uh, it focuses on areas like building a better business environment for game studios, improving routes into the industry for a wider diverse talent pool, and also working to demonstrate the cultural and artistic value of games beyond them being viewed only from a more commercial lens. We also actually have connections to organisations like the BFI because we're part of the screen industries. Uh, their cultural test for British video games is necessary to access video games expenditure credits right now. These organisations often work to advocate for the games industries to be given acknowledgement and support as part of wider policy, as well as aiming to support improvements within the industry itself. They also have collections of resources that can be helpful to support your studio, like this collection of boilerplate contracts from Yuki that you can then adjust to your own particular needs. So I hope that provided an interesting jumping off point for you. Uh, this is just meant to be a starting point to consider integrating academic research as another lens or perspective to your own personal and professional experience. There isn't a hard line between academia and practice, which I think is a good thing, and there's lots of developers who move in between these worlds, teaching and conducting research. I'm sure many of you will be familiar with Richard Lamarchand, who was a lead designer at Naughty Dog for the Uncharted series, and is now an associate professor at the Games Program at the University of Southern California. You can go away and read this work purely out of personal interest, or to reflect on your own experiences as a player or as a maker. Of course, there are many people, including in AdventureX, and big shout out to them, who are interested in reading and sharing this kind of work, together with our industry articles and think pieces. So I hope it might prove a useful source of potential solutions to problems or just fresh ideas to bring to your work. Uh, for myself, I've recently joined Blue Sky, so I'll post the link in that chat so you can find my contact there. But in the spirit of being part of a rich tapestry, I hope you've been enjoying the rest of Adventure X. Be sure to check out our featured games and thank you.